Okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, and welcome to uh, RSM's financial reporting update for 2022. Uh, my name is Ralph Martin. I'm the National Technical Director at RSM Australia, and a special year for us this year because we're celebrating our 100th birthday, um, and still plenty to talk about in the financial reporting space. Um, joining me is uh, Nikki Wong, who's a senior manager in our National Technical Division. And uh, Nikki's going to be helping me today, and in particular, um, helping me with all the questions and answers. So uh, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Zoom webinars by now, but um, just a reminder that you do have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you have any questions, uh, just type them in as we go, and we'll, we'll try to answer them all, all as we go. And we'll also have time for Q&A at the end. So uh, we'll do our very best to answer all of your questions. A um, couple of things that I'm always asked. Um, the slides for this, we will be sending around um, a PDF of the slides afterwards, so you'll have them available. And we will be also uh, recording this webinar, so the recording will be available. Although if you uh, do have uh, colleagues, friends, associates who you think uh, might be interested after you've seen this, uh, we are doing this whole thing again next week on Wednesday. So uh, they're very welcome to register and join us for that. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, usually these sessions, I talk about new accounting standards and interpretations. That's what I've been doing for the past few years. but. Uh, the good news um, is that there isn't actually much to talk about in the space of new accounting standards. So there are very few this year, um, but that doesn't mean that I don't have anything to talk about. There's actually still a lot going on. Um, so what I'll focus on this year is uh, firstly the removal of special purpose financial statements, which is probably the big issue in Australia for, for this upcoming financial reporting season. I'll also talk about IFRIC agenda decisions. If you've got no idea what they are, don't worry. I, I shall explain and explain why they are important. Um, I'll talk about what the regulator, ASIC, is doing and uh, what their surveillance and enforcement activities are and their focus areas and uh, how to make sure we avoid getting in, entangled with them. And then I'll talk briefly at the end about what's happening in the not-for-profit sector and some of the developments there. So uh, plenty to talk about, but um, as I say, I, I, we do like questions, so send them all through and we'll uh, try and answer as we go. A couple of things that are new before we get into uh, the main body of the presentation. Just wanted to highlight the one of the recent developments was the uh, development of a director identification number. So all, Aust all directors in Australia are now required to have a director identification number. That's unique to each director and it follows them around for life basically through all their appointments. So uh, it's actually a kind of anti-fraud and anti-phoenixing measure that the ASIC have brought in. So uh, for anyone who's applying for any new directorships or becoming a director, you'll need one of those now. Um, if you're an existing director, you've got until 30th November, 2022. Although my advice would be to get on with it and, and do it now. Uh, rather than be part of what will no doubt be the rush on 29th of November, 2022. Um, if you have any more questions about that, I put the link there to the article on our website. Um, it'll, it'll give a bit more detail, um, but yeah, make sure if you're a director that uh, you uh, get, get ahead of that and get your DIN as soon as possible. Another, some other changes to the Corporations Act that uh, happened uh, during the past 12 months. And what these really do is make permanent some of the changes that were initially done as temporary measures during COVID. Um, and the, the two I would probably highlight are electronic documents and electronic meetings. Now the Corporation Act 2001, so it was written in mainly in the late 1990s, um, it didn't really contemplate the existence of virtual meetings or of electronic signatures. Um, so it was really silent on whether they were allowed or not. And what the changes do is make clear that, in fact, both of those things are allowed. Electronic signatures are permissible. Um, and in particular for AGMs, they can now be held virtually. You can now hold them as a virtual meeting rather than a physical meeting, or you can do a hybrid meeting that's a combination of both. That's probably a good thing, um, particularly in the listed sector, because I, I've been to various listed company AGMs where there's kind of three men and a dog at it. Um, and once you make it, put it online, it actually makes it much easier for shareholders to attend. 
the requirement is though that the thing I would highlight about that is it is still required to be a meeting, a genuine meeting, not a webinar. So not something like this where I can do all the talking and uh, um, can choose how many questions I have or which questions to avoid. It has to be a genuine meeting where shareholders have the opportunity to interact with and question management. Um, but if you set it up that way, then yeah, it can absolutely be done virtually from now on, and that's now a permanent change to the law in Australia. Okay, so probably the big issue for 30th of June 2022 is the removal of special purpose financial statements. And this is something that's long been seen as kind of a problem in the Australian financial reporting landscape, because the 2021 and all subsequent years, what or all previous years rather, what uh, what the uh, law and the accounting standards effectively said was, uh, we're going to make certain entities lodge accounts as public on the public record. Um, large proprietary companies are probably the biggest example here. We're going to say they're so big and so significant, we're going to make them lodge accounts on the public record that are available to anyone. But then what the directors have to do is make an assessment of who's using their accounts and what purpose they're using for them. And based on that, they have to decide whether to prepare general or special purpose financial statements. Now, that kind of put directors in an impossible position because once you lodge accounts on public record, you've got no idea who's reading your accounts or what they're using them for. Um, but you were asked to make this decision. Um, and we all have so had the situation where um, for 2021 and previous years, we had these three tiers of financial reporting. So. Listed companies and uh, public interest entities did uh, tier one for IFRS. Um, that was simple enough and hasn't really changed. Then for entities that were doing general purpose financial statements but weren't public interest entities or public accounts entities, they could do what was called RDR, the Reduced Disclosure Regime, which was for IFRS for recognition and measurement, but it took about out about 60 to 70% of all the disclosure requirements in IFRS. But uh, most large proprietary companies, not-for-profits and various other entities did special purpose financial reports. Uh, the research showed something like 70% or, or even more in some years of all financial statements that were lodged with ASIC were special purpose financial reports where the entity chose exactly which disclosures it did, didn't, didn't have and in a lot of cases uh, didn't actually comply with all the recognition and measurement requirements of Australian accounting standards. It was kind of a gray area as to how much they had to do that. So that was that was uh, last year. What's changing this year? Well, the top box hasn't really changed. If you're a listed company, a public interest entity, you still have to do full IFRS. Um, that hasn't changed. But tier two, you'll see has changed from RDR to SDS, the Simplified Disclosure Standard. So RDR no longer exists. There's now a simplified disclosure standard, which is conceptually pretty similar. It, it's still full recognition and measurement, um, but with very much reduced disclosures. It's just that the disclosures have changed a bit. They've added a few in and taken a few away, but now it's about 70% of all IFRS disclosures have been taken out. But the big thing that's changed is who has to do it. So it's not just entities with dependent users, it's it's also, if you look at the bottom two bullet points there, most large proprietary companies will now have to lodge under SDS. And also some trustees, partnerships, joint ventures, um, or even small proprietary companies will have to lodge under SDS. And I'll talk in a minute about exactly who's caught. Um, what hasn't changed special purpose financial reports, um, not for profits, um, haven't really changed. If they were, were lodging special purpose previously, they can still do that. Um, and also some trustees, partnerships and joint ventures. Now, let me explain a bit more about who exactly is caught by this. So who has to prepare general purpose financial statements now? Well, there's really two boxes here. The first is anyone who has to prepare financial statements under legislation, and that legislation the four profit entities refers to Australian accounting standards or accounting standards. So it can refer to Australian accounting standards or accounting standards. So if there's any legislation that says you have to prepare accounts under either of those, then in future you will have to prepare 
general purpose financial statements. There won't be an option to prepare special purpose financial statements. Now, the biggest and most obvious example of that is the Corporations Act 2001. Anyone who has to lodge accounts under that will have to do general purpose in future. Uh, but it also um, applies to various other bits of legislation at both Commonwealth and state and territory level. Um, things like the Aboriginal Corporations Act, um, certain acts for sort of building entities, financial institutions and so on, all refer to accounting standards. But uh, basically, if you're, you're preparing accounts because the law tells you you have to, in future, they must be general purpose before profit entities. The other one, and, and this is probably the, the trickier one that's going to catch people out, is where you have to prepare accounts under what's called a constituting document. Now that doesn't just mean a constitution, it can, can actually mean any document. Any document that, um, any document that um, requires you, requires you to prepare a, accounts under Australian accounting standards, and that document has been modified on or after 1st of July, 2021. So it can be a constitution, it can be a joint venture agreement, it could be a partnership agreement, it can even be um, things like a bank loan agreement or a shareholders agreement. Bank loan agreements is a tricky one because uh, we've, we, we've seen instances where banks have put in their bank loan agreement that you must provide that accounts to the bank every year and those bank accounts must be prepared under Australian accounting standards. Now you're only caught by this if that document is modified on or after 1st of July 2021. But the problem is this, think of a typical bank loan agreement. It'll say there's terms and conditions and the bank can change them at any time. And every year the bank fiddle about with it and change their terms and conditions, which means they are modifying that document, which means even if the bit that talks about preparing accounts hasn't changed at all, it will be caught by this. So if you do have bank loans that say you have to give accounts to the bank, do go and have a look at them and see exactly what they say. Because if they say those accounts must be prepared under Australian accounting standards, you potentially have a problem and you probably want to be going and talking to your bank to say, can you remove that requirement? For, for constituting documents, it has to be Australian accounting standards. If it just says accounting standards or accounting principles or commonly accepted accounting principles or any wording to that effect, you don't have to do general purpose financial statements. It's only where there's a reference to Australian accounting standards. Okay, Ralph, we have one question. So the question is, is an unlisted public company a tier one or a tier two? Yeah, uh, good question. If I go back to my previous slide, where do unlisted public companies fall? The answer is, um, as long as they're unlisted, um, they, they do fall into tier two. They have dependent users, but uh, they're not a listed company. They don't have publicly accountability, um, so they can prepare tier two. They have a choice, of course. They can choose to prepare tier one if they want to, and that might be the case, if, particularly if they're looking to transition to be a listed company, but uh, generally they can prepare under tier two. Okay, so all of this is coming out of a new accounting standard. Uh, WASB 1060 um, and well, the new standards mandatory from 1 July 2021. There was some transitional relief available if you early adopted, but uh, if you're adopting year, this year, I'm afraid it's too late to take advantage of that. So it replaces the existing uh, reduced disclosure regime. Um, and it is only a disclosure standard. It is disclosure only. Um, anyone preparing general purpose accounts must comply with the full recognition and measurement requirements of accounting standards. Um, and it applies to for-profits and not-for-profits. So, so far I've been saying all of this applies to for-profits only. What's the impact on not-for-profits? Well, if you're a not-for-profit, um, you're preparing under RDR at the moment, then you can't do that anymore. You need to transition to STS. But if you're a not-for-profit and you're not a reporting entity, and you're preparing special purpose accounts at the moment, um, then you still have some new requirements. First, you have to disclose the basis on which you believe special purpose accounts are appropriate. So why you think there are no dependent users relying on your accounts. And that might be quite difficult in the not-for-profit sector because 
you might have funding bodies, you might have donators, you might have members. Um, there, there are various people that do actually look at not-for-profitist accounts. So that this might act as a trigger to sort of push some not-for-profit entities to say, actually, we should be doing general purpose accounts under their SDS. Because it, the other thing it'll require is if you do do special purpose accounts, you will have to explain whether you are compliant with the recognition and measurement requirements of Australian accounting standards, and if not, where you're not complying so that users can clearly understand that. And that might be quite an onerous disclosure to do um, if you aren't complying. So again, there'll be a big push for not profits to actually comply with Australian accounting standards. So just to summarize, um, if you're a for-profit entity and you're currently doing special purpose financial statements and you are able to continue doing so, in other words, you're doing it solely for management purposes, not for any statutory reporting purposes, you can carry on, but um, you will have to state whether you comply with recognition and measurement and with consolidation and equity accounting. Most entities that currently prepare special purpose and lodge them with ASIC will now have to do either tier one or two, tier two, most will do tier two, general purpose financial statements. If you're doing reduced disclosure regime at the moment, you have to transition to SDS. If you're doing tier one full IFRS, then nothing really changes, you still do full IFRS. Um, so uh, in the not-for-profit sector at the moment, optional adoption. I'll, I'll talk a bit later about what's happening in the not-for-profit sector financial reporting framework. So for anyone transitioning from special purpose to general purpose, what are the big impacts? Well, if you haven't early adopted, firstly, you will have to do this retrospectively. So you will also have to restate your comparatives and the new disclosures that you have to include will have to include comparative disclosures as well. So effectively your date of initial adoption of general purpose will be 1 July 2020. You'll have your 2021 comparative and your 2022 actual result. The other big impact is that um, because all recognition and measurement requirements are now required, and the WSP 1060 makes clear that included in that is consolidation and equity accounting. So previously, um, the standards were ambiguous on this and what a lot of special purpose preparers did was argue that consolidation was a disclosure standard. I always thought it was a fairly dubious argument, but it was quite widespread. They argued that consolidation was a disclosure standard and therefore they didn't have to prepare consolidated accounts. So what a lot of groups of companies did was they just had a non-operating holding company and all it had in it was a bunch of investments in subsidiaries. And that's what they lodged with ASIC. And the trading results were in one of those subsidiaries, so they were actually kind of hidden. That is not permitted anymore. So if you are having to lodge accounts with ASIC, they do have to comply with the consolidation standard, and they will have to do that retrospectively. So you will have to do two years of consolidations if you are moving to general purpose for the first time. So it'll be a big impact. Consolidations and equity accounting for investments and joint ventures. It'll be a big impact for any entities who are in that position. And the other big impact will be related party disclosures. They are required for the first time for anyone who's doing special purpose. That's often a controversial one. And again, comparatives will be required. So you will need to go back two years. Okay, anyone who did early adopt did have a, a, an exemption from restating comparative information. So anyone who's, if, if for some reason you haven't done your 2021 accounts um, yet, um, I would adopt for 2021. And this might apply for anyone who's got a December year. And if you're still doing December, I'd suggest early adopting as of 31 December 2021, because then you won't have to restate your comparatives. Um, you'll just do the current year at 31 December 21. And then when you get to 31 December 2022, um, you will already have your comparatives done for you. So it won't be such a big deal. Same advice I'd give to anyone who's got a March year and then is doing 31 March 2022 accounts. You're not technically caught by this because your, your year began before 1st of July 2021, but I would recommend early adoption. Okay. Last thing that's happened recently is new announcement, WSP 2020-2, it amends an existing standard. And this really applies to anyone who is consolidating for the first time. What it says is that for anyone who is consolidating for the first time, 
you have the option to recognize goodwill based on the difference between your, the investment in subsidiaries you had previously and the share of the net assets in the subsidiaries that you're recognizing for the first time now that you're consolidating them. So you do have the option to recognize goodwill. Um, I highlight that as an option because my advice in most cases is probably going to be don't take advantage of this uh, because having goodwill on your balance sheet is a bit of a pain actually. Because once you've got goodwill on your balance sheet, you have to impairment test that goodwill every year forever until you eventually write it off. And that's probably more trouble than it's worth for most private entities. Um, so my advice is probably don't take advantage of that um, option. Okay. So that's the, uh, that's the uh, end of special purpose financial statement for profit entities. As I say, if there are any questions on that, happy to take them, do send them through the Q&A box and we, we will answer them. But the next thing I wanted to talk about is IFRIC agenda decisions. Now, unless you're an accounting technical nerd like Nikki and myself, you probably don't spend a lot of your life thinking about IFRIC agenda decisions. You may never have thought about them. In fact, you may be think, think, sitting there thinking, why is he talking about agenda decisions? Why do I care what someone puts on their agenda? Well, let me explain why they're important. The IFRIC is a body, it's the International Financial Reporting Interpretations Council, and it sits in London and works alongside the Accounting Standards Board. And the way it works is that anyone, and absolutely anyone, can submit a question to it. But the question has to be about IFRS, and it should be about areas where they say there's ambiguity or lack of clarity in IFRS. And as a result, there's diversity in practice. People are treating the same transaction in different ways. And anyone can say, um, hey, Ms. hey, IFRIC, um, I found this area where I don't think accounting standards are clear under IFRS. Um, can you deal with it? Can you tell me what the right answer is? And uh, when it gets questions, the IFRIC can do any one of four things. It can issue an interpretation where it says, yes, I agree the wording in IFRS was unclear and therefore there was diversity in practice. Here's an interpretation to show how it should be done. And interpretations are, they're not standards, but they effectively are a form of standard. They have force of law. They're part of IFRS exactly the same as accounting standards. If you go on the Australian Accounting Standards Board's website, you can download all of the interpretations. There aren't any new ones this year, but examples of recent ones would be um, things like uncertain tax petitions, things like debt for equity swaps, things like lease incentives. And they basically interpret how exactly you should be doing them. So they can do that. The other thing they can do is recommend to the standards board to say, yeah, there's a problem with the accounting standards, the wording's unclear or it's badly drafted or it doesn't cover an important area. Can you go and amend an existing standard or even write a new accounting standard? So that's another thing they can do. But the fourth thing they can do is to say in response to a query, no, actually we think the accounting standards are clear. There is only one way to treat this transaction under accounting standards and here it is. And because of that, we're not going to take this onto our agenda. So that's what an agenda decision is. It's basically uh, their view of the, what the, the way accounting standards should be interpreted and that their view that the accounting standards are clear on how a transaction should be treated. Now, technically, these don't have force of law. They're not accounting standards, but they are what I call semi-authoritative pronouncements because it's basically part of the standard setting body issuing a st public statement on how IFRS should be interpreted. And therefore, if you want to comply with IFRS, you really do have to comply with these. Um, actually, some, are, some bodies, and um, including the European Union, have now legislated to say, these are authoritative pronouncements that you must adopt to comply with IFRS. Um, Australia hasn't done that yet, but regardless of that, you, you really have to comply with these if you want to comply with IFRS and thereby with Australian accounting standards. So that's why they're important. So what agenda decisions have there been recently? Well, I haven't listed them all. I've, I've only listed the ones I think relevant. There's certain other ones that are neat, very niche that I, I haven't included here. But the big one, we'll talk through a few of these, but the big one I wanted to focus on is cloud computing arrangements. This is a big one where um, Nikki and I have been doing a lot of work in this area over the past 12 months. Because 
the issue is really that the current standard on intangible assets was written over 20 years ago. And when it was written, software was something that you went out to a shop and you bought and you took it back and it was came either on a, a CD or possibly even on a floppy disk. Remember those if you're really old like me. And you took it and you loaded it up on your computer and then you ran it on your computer and that was the way software worked. And it was pretty clear you bought a bit disk if I pay $10,000 for a bit of software. I own that disk, I can use that software. I've got an intangible asset, great. Now, nowadays, how does software work? Well, I might download it onto my computer, um, but more, common, more and more commonly these days, we have software as a service arrangement. Software as a service where actually you don't download anything. What you get is the right to access something that sits up in the cloud and you buy a license to use, use it or use certain bits of it for however long your license lasts for. So the problem here is you, the problem here is um, you don't actually have anything that you own. You just have a right to use something for a certain period of time. Now, a right to use something, you might think, well, that sounds like a lease, but actually in intangibles are scoped out of the lease standard, so you can't apply that. Um, so what do you do? Well, if we could put out an agenda decision to explain this, how do you treat, firstly, how you treat um, cloud computing software as a service arrangements, but then the specific thing they looked at was, if I enter into a software as a service arrangement, but I end also enter into a contract with the cloud provider to do all sorts of customization and configuration on their software before I can use it to make it exactly the way I want, how do I treat those costs as well? And the, what the agenda decision said was, um, firstly, if you don't control the software, it can't be your intangible asset. So generally, so cloud computing and software as a service arrangements are not intangible assets for the buyer because they don't create a resource that you control, control other than in certain limited circumstances, which we will touch on in a minute. And therefore, therefore, that means also the related customization and configuration costs can't be treated as an intangible asset. Okay, so I said generally you can't treat it as an intangible. When might you be able to recognize an intangible? Well, it's generally one of these three situations. If you have the contractual right to take possession of the software, so you actually have the ownership of the underlying code, then you can recognize it as an intangible. Secondly, if you have an exclusive right to use it, so even if the vendor retains the IP over the code, if you're the only person who can use it, or the only entity that can use it and no one else in the world can use it, so you have an exclusive right to it, then under IFRS that meets the definition of ownership. You have substantially all the economic benefits, so in substance you own it, so you can recognize an intangible. The third situation you can potentially recognize an intangible asset is if you do customization or configuration on cloud software, and you create the code as part of that configuration or customization that you own, and that code has value outside the software as a service arrangement. So if, for example, I have a software as a service arrangement with a vendor, they have some software set up in the cloud. I write some software that I own to make that software interface with all of my other software. And, and this is the crucial and difficult bit, I can use that code independently of the software as a service arrangement. So I could, for example, use it as an interface to other bits of software as well. So it has value beyond the software as a service arrangement. In that case, I can recognize an intangible asset for the cost of the code that I wrote and own and can use independently. But generally, generally cloud computing and software as a service arrangements aren't intangible assets just a license cost, so you just recognize it over the term of the license. If I'm paying $10,000 a year each year for three years, and that's what my license says, I just recognize an expense for each year for three years. But then how do I treat any customization or configuration costs that I, that I have upfront? So in my example, I've got $10,000 license each year for three years. Um, that's what I've signed up for. 
But then before that, I spent $15,000 $15, to customize and configure that software to be the way I like it. How do I recognize that? A lot of entities have been recognizing it as an intangible asset, and you can't do that. You can't do that because the underlying software isn't your intangible. So customizing and configuring it can't be your intangible either. So how do I recognize it? Well, it depends. Answer to most technical queries, it depends. And it depends on whether that customization and configuration is distinct. Now that's actually a, an accounting technical term that comes out of the revenue standard, but um, it's what, what we apply here. And generally the way it works is that um, if the customization and configuration is being performed by a third party supplier, not the person who's licensing you the software, then it is distinct. It's a separate service and you have to recognize it as an expense at the time that that service is provided. If on the other hand, you are paying the software license or for the customization configuration, then it's judgmental, but usually what we found, usually what we found is that those services are not distinct. It's part of your software license. So if in my example, I'm paying $10,000 a year each year for three years and $15,000 upfront costs, in that case, if I'm paying the software vendor for this customization configuration, I just add it onto the license fee. So even though I pay it upfront, I would then recognize a prepayment of $15,000 and amortize that over the term of my license, $5,000 a year. So I've now got a total expense of $15,000 a year. So, so the treatment of my customization and configuration costs will depend on whether I'm paying a third party to do it or whether I'm paying the software vendor to do it. Okay, uh, Ralph, we have a question. So we kind of test your IT knowledge as well. So um, a cloud-based ERP system like SAP S4 HANA, how does that software fit into software as a service or intangible asset criteria? Yeah, if you have a cloud-based ERP system, um, probably it's not going to meet the definition of an intangible because you don't own the software, you don't have the right to modify, customize it, you don't have the right to sell it, it's not your IP. It doesn't sit on, mostly, mostly it doesn't sit on your infrastructure, it sits up in the cloud. Um, so probably it wouldn't meet the definition of an intangible. Um, as always with these things, there's a potentially a gray area that you have software where some of it sits on your computer and some of it sits up in the cloud, but um, that's one of those areas where you've got to look at the substance of the arrangement. And generally in these arrangements, most of it sits up in the cloud. Therefore you couldn't recognize an intangible. It would be a software as a service arrangement. And therefore you'd recognize it as a license over the term of the license. Thank you. Um, we got another question about um, those cloud computing arrangements. So um, the audience have customized a product, but they don't sign up a fixed term contract. So how do you amortize this as a prepayment? Yeah, if you haven't got any contract term, um, in other words, either party could cancel it next week, then you can't really treat it as a prepayment. You would have to expense it as it's incurred which I know is not an answer that uh, the question is probably liking, um, but I'm afraid is the way it works. That there is customization and configuration costs are going to be expensed up front to a greater degree than previously under this interpretation. Because yeah, if, if something is distinct, you recognize it as an expense immediately. And remember any third party Customization configuration is distinct, so you recognize it as an expense when the work is done. It's only if it's not distinct and provided by the software provider, you recognize it as an expense over the contract term. There is going to be a certain amount of judgment in working out what is and isn't distinct. So that was the way that the uh, cloud computing IFRIC decision, agenda decision was resolved. Um, if you do have uh, cloud software, you do need to look at it for this year. Um, the thing about IFRIC agenda decisions is um, they don't have years and years of implementation time. What the IFRIC is effectively saying is this is what the accounting standards were saying all along. Um, so if you do 
are changing as a result of it. You do have to uh, change this year and change retrospectively. You would have to change your comparatives as well. Um, personally, I'm, I'm not going to be sort of religious on making people say that it's an error. I think it will be acceptable to say it's a change in accounting policy. You won't have to use the term error. Um, but you will have to do it this year and retrospectively for the prior year if you've been capitalising cloud computing costs previously and you can't do this any longer. Um, as I say, this is an area where Nikki and I have been doing a lot of advice in the, in the past couple of months. So if you do have further questions, feel free to get in touch with us and we can discuss specific situations because it is quite facts and circumstances specific this. Okay. Let's talk about some other IFRIC agenda decisions. Um, next one was around non-going concern accounts. Now, the issue here is that um, what happens when you have an entity that, and they're not preparing accounts on the going concern basis? And, and this is quite common. Um, it's not just when entities go bust. It's also when an entity has a sort of finite life and is getting to the end of life. And it's quite common in things like property syndicates or property development entities where it's to develop or, or own a particular property. And when they sell the property, the, the life of the entity ends. And therefore, when the property is about to be sold or plan to be sold in the next few months, you're probably pre preparing accounts on a non-going concern basis. The question was, how do I treat comparatives? How do I treat comparatives? Do I also have to restate them on a non-going concern basis? And the answer was really no. No, you don't have to. If you prepared last year's comparatives on a non-going concern basis, um, then it's an um, then you don't have to restate your comparatives, but you will have to prepare this year's results on a non-going concern basis. And generally what that means is you have to show all of your assets and liabilities as current, and um, you have to write them down to um, their realizable value, which may or may not be their fair value. Um, in certain situations, it can be a fire sale value or otherwise reduced value because um, there's often significant selling costs involved. So you have to write your assets down to some extent often, uh, but you don't have to restate your comparatives. Somewhat linked to that, um, this was an interesting one, costs necessary to sell inventories. Now we all know it's what you learn on kind of day one in the accounting school is that uh, inventory is shown at the lower of cost and net realizable value. But what the standards were always a little bit unclear on is what exactly is net realizable value? What costs do you include when you work out your net realizable value? Is it just the incremental cost of selling it, or do you have to include all of the costs of selling it? And the answer the Africa said was you have to include all of the costs of selling it. So for example, if you have inventory and you're going to sell it, but it's going to sit around in your warehouse for several months, you would have to include some level of the overheads of your warehouse in your net realizable value calculation. Similarly, if there's marketing, selling, distribution, transport costs, that sort of thing involved in selling your inventory, you would have to include all of those when you work out your net realizable value. So when you apply this, what I can see is that um, when you're working out the lower of your cost or net realizable value, there's perhaps more instances than we previously thought where net realizable value is lower than cost. And it probably means your net realizable value is a bit more difficult to work out than it was because it isn't just the selling price. It's the selling price less certain costs. And there's probably going to be a certain amount of judgment in working out which costs they were. So um, if you have significant inventory balances, and particularly if you have slow moving inventory, um, do get onto this early. It's uh, something that will require some thought for 30th of June, 2022 year ends. Um, next, the one I want to talk about, this is a bit more niche, but I do think it has some application outside the narrow fact pattern that the IFRIC considered was a wind farm. Um, and the question was, if you have a wind farm and it generates electricity and sells that into the grid, and it generates, um, as renewable energy does in Australia, it will generate carbon certificates. Um, it will generate carbon certificates under the National ENGAS scheme. Um, anyone who's involved in renewable energy will know what that is. Um, so it generates carbon credits, and someone enters into a, an agreement with the wind farm to say, I'll take all of your electricity for the next 20 years at a fixed price, and all of your carbon certificates, because I'm, I'm a polluter, I need to 
have carbon certificates to surrender to the government when I, to offset my carbon emissions. And the question was, are they therefore entering into a lease for that wind farm? And the answer the IFRIC said was no. And the reason for that is they may be the, have a PPA to take all of the electricity, but actually it doesn't really. Because the way it works is the uh, wind farm will deliver electricity to the, the, the national grid or the state grid in Australia. Um, it'll deliver energy to the grid and the customer will just take energy from the grid that's actually come from any, anywhere. Um, but they're entering into this PPA in really to get the renewable energy credits, the carbon credits. So in this situation, the power purchase agreement did not contain a lease. Um, so that's potentially relevant for, for anyone who's involved in carbon credits, renewable energy, both as a buyer and a seller of these. The last question that you consider, and this is still a tentative one, so uh, you can still uh, submit a comment letter. Nikki and I have just drafted RSM's comment letter on this. Um, is what, what happens if you're a landlord and you forgive rent? Um, and we've seen a lot of this over the past couple of years with COVID and various other restrictions, bushfires, that sort of thing. Um, what do you do if you forgive rent? How do you treat it? And the answer, as with everything technical, was it depends. What rent are you actually forgiving? Are you forgiving rent for periods that have already been passed and the rent's been invoiced, but now you're saying, yeah, you think the tenant can't pay, so I'll just forgive it? Or are you forgiving it for future periods that haven't yet happened? And depending on that, that'll determine how you forgive rent. If you're forgiving previous arrears, what, it said, what the IFRIC said is um, you apply the expected credit loss model under WSB9, which is a complicated way of saying you treat it as a bad debt. You treat it as a bad debt and write off like you would any other bad debt. If on the other hand, you're forgiving rent for future periods, then what you're actually doing is modifying your lease contract. And therefore, you have to treat it as a modification of lease contract and treat the, it over the remaining lease term. So let's say I have, say to one of my tenants, I can see you're struggling. I'll forgive you your rent for the next year. And your rent, say, $10,000 a year. But they've got a five-year lease remaining. So you're forgiving $10,000 of rent, um, but they've got a five-year lease remaining at $10,000 a year. So you wouldn't recognize the loss or, or the hit to your p and in year one. What you would actually do is straight line it over the remaining lease term. So uh, over the remaining lease term, there was in total $50,000 to pay, and there's now $40,000. Um, so you now recognize a rental income of just $8,000 a year that remaining lease term. So you straight line your, the effect of your rent forgiveness over the entire remaining lease. Okay, that was IFRIC agenda decisions. As I say, they, they are increasingly important. So if you are in a financial reporting role, um, it is something you maybe need to atten pay attention to just as much as you pay attention to accounting standards. Um, and the other thing that's happened in recent years is the IFRIC agenda decisions have got longer and more explanatory. They used to be, uh, now we're not just doing this, but now they actually explain the accounting. Um, so really you almost have to treat them as mini accounting interpretations um, and apply them. So now let's talk about ASIC focus areas. Why am I talking about this? Because ASIC have been getting more active in their surveillance activities in the past uh, couple of years. And for anyone who's not aware, ASIC have kind of have three streams that they run. They have an audit inspection unit that inspects auditors, that inspects um, and RSM and all other large firms get inspected every year as part of being an audit firm. But they also have a financial reporting surveillance unit and what the Financial Reporting Surveillance Unit does is it's a group of people that sat, sit in a room in Sydney um, and they review all of the financial statements that are lodged with ASIC. Um, not every single set, they generally review 200 to 300 sets a year, primarily they're listed, but they do do some unlisted financial statements as well, um, particularly some higher profile entities. Um, they review all of those sets of financial statements. It's a team of people that do that. So if you thought your job was boring, at least you don't have that job. Um, and they then write to the directors to ask queries about anything they don't like that looks like it doesn't comply with uh, 
Australian accounting standards. So that's the second stream that I think have. The third stream they have is the disciplinary and enforcement stream that you really don't want to be a part of. Um, because that goes after both auditors and directors that have done something bad and, and will take them to court in certain instances. Um, and, and by the way, ASIC have been getting more active in taking to court entities that don't lodge financial statements when they do meet the thresholds for a large proprietary company. Um, so if you are a large proprietary and you're, you're doing that, stop it and lodge some financial statements, I would recommend that. Um, but for their financial reporting surveillance, so uh, they will write to directors and then they'll, they'll be correspondence back and forth. The directors have to explain what they did in their accounts. And if ASIC still are not happy, they will make people change either prospectively or retrospectively. And when they do that, they put out a media release. And that, that's never a great look to have your name in an ASIC media release saying, we think this entity's got their accounts wrong and we made them change it. So what have ASIC been looking at? Um, well, their 2021 surveillance, activities focused on a few areas. One the big one, actually, that I'd highlight is the operating and financial review. So it's not just the financial statements, the bit that's audited, it's also the operating and financial review, which isn't audited. Um, the auditors aren't required to look at that. They're only required to read it and see whether it's consistent with the accounts. And they've been looking at the extent to which different entities disclose in the things in the operating financial review. They've also been looking at fair values and impairment assessments um, and valuation of property assets. Um, and a few other areas, disclosure of government assistance, particularly around JobKeeper, non afrous information I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and also they're looking increasingly at cloud computing. They've said that. So I won't rehash it again, but um, yeah, for, if you do have cloud computing arrangements, you really need to get that right this year and make sure not, you're not inappropriately recognizing intangibles. So if I look at what they looked at at 30th of June, 2021, and this is just the June account, which is why the number's a little bit lower. Um, the public report talks about 150 listed entities. They also talk about some, they also review some private companies, but they don't generally talk about that so much in a public report. So if there's 150 listed entities that they looked at their accounts. They wrote to the directors of a 30 of them, 20%. And of the ones they wrote to, 29 of them, just under half of them, they wrote about impairments and expected credit losses. And 10 of them, just about a third of them, they wrote about their operating and financial review. Um, so those were the areas they focused on. And they put out media releases about three different entities where they wrote about the operating and financial review. And then subsequently, those entities had to make material, make ASX announcements about material business risks that they hadn't previously disclosed. Again, not a great look if you're an ASX listed company to do that as a result of an ASIC um, investigation, particularly as ASIC then also puts out a media release to, to basically name and shame you. Similarly on the accounts, they also put out media releases about people they think have done things that are wrong or questionable um, and have been caught in ASIC's financial reporting surveillance. So here's some of the recent ones. This isn't actually all of them, um, but just a few examples. Valuations of goodwill and intangibles is like the number one focus area for this thing. And they, if they uh, question your goodwill assessment and then um, question the assumptions and then later you write it down, they will put out a media release. Um, Woodside um, was an interesting one that they were basically got wrong um, the way they uh, accounted for the provisions or and rehabilitation of their offshore oil rigs. So ASIC, as a result of ASIC's surveillance, they not only increased their provision substantially, but also increased their disclosure substantially around the key assumptions and judgments they were making in setting that provision. Um, so for those of you in mining and resources with environmental liabilities, um, do think carefully about the disclosures. Um, some disclosures in mining companies are pretty skinny on rehabilitation so provisions, but it's often a key estimate and judgment that there should be disclosure around. Um, and similarly on make good provisions, uh, leased properties, they, they have caught out a few entities, I've highlighted one, but there are actually a couple of others, where entities had big lease commitments, retailers, for example, but they weren't making any make good provision. And virtually all leases do have a make good clause in them. So um, if you don't have a make good provision at all, that is inviting an ASIC query around your lease liabilities. Early pay was an interesting one that they uh, had some debt that was actually due to be uh, repaid um, 
within 12 months, and they classified this as non-current on the basis it was probably going to be refinanced. Um, that is wrong. Um, that is wrong. The, the classification based on between non-current and current is based on the contractual position on balance sheet date. The likelihood of any future refinancing is irrelevant. If you haven't yet refinanced on the balance sheet date, you need to classify it as current. And the early pay had to restate their accounts to reflect that. The last one, Oliver's Real Food, was uh, probably a bit of a cautionary tale and does have some relevance for quite a lot of entities, I think. In that they, Oliver's Real Food was a, a retailer. 2020, they wrote down various goodwill and some other intangibles based on COVID, um, much reduced trading results, lower footfall in their stores, that sort of thing. And then in 2021, they reversed it based on their expectation that COVID was over. Ha uh ha. -huh. Um, and that their trading results were going to increase greatly in future. Problem was that wasn't really based on any actual results today. Their, their trading had actually got worse in 2021 than it was in 2020. Um, it hadn't reversed. And the impairment standard says you can only reverse a, an in, in, impairment loss when there are actual indications of reversal, that the circumstances have changed. Um, and that actually hadn't happened the 30th of June, 2021. So what did Oliver's have to do? Well, come 31st of December 2021, they had to write it all back down again. Um, obviously not a great look. Write something down, reverse it, write it down again. Um, it'd be interesting to see their 30th of June 2020 accounts, whether they reverse it again. Um, but um, yeah, just, just don't jump the gun on impairment reversals, particularly with COVID related. You do have to wait until you can show sustained recovery from um, COVID trading conditions before you reverse any impairment. Okay. Um, so let's talk about um, assets focus areas. Asset values is always the number one um, area. Um, but the point they made generally is there's a greater risk estimation uncertainty. We've still got COVID and its effects lingering on. We've got inflation, um, supply chain shortages, semiconductor shortages, war in Ukraine. There's all sorts of factors that mean that it's probably greater economic uncertainty in the moment than there has been certainly pre-COVID, but probably even during COVID. Um, and therefore disclosures around that uncertainty and the sensitivities for the key estimates and judgments are increasingly important. I mentioned the operating and financial review a few times, but what ASIC highlighted that in some situations they looked at, for example, two companies that were same industry, very similar place in their life cycle. And there was one company that had two paragraphs in their OFR and another company that had 16 pages. And these were similar size companies in similar industries, same place in their life cycle. That, that suggests that um, some companies are not taking the OFR as serious as they should, in Essex's view. Um, and the OFR actually needs to under, not just be a selling job of how great your company is doing, it actually needs to explain the underlying drivers of the result, including the risks, the risks, management strategies, and future prospects, both positive and negative, it has to be a balanced assessment. The other thing that I mentioned is that anyone who isn't mentioning climate change at all in their OFR review probably has a big gap in there. Because um, it's not just about those in the industries that are directly affected. Um, there's also probably greater propensity for extreme weather events, cyclones and the like. Um, there's probably changing consumer behavior. There's also changing regulatory landscape across the world. If you sell products to the European Union, um, you have to label them in, in a lot of instances with uh, how much carbon you you generate to sell the product. So climate change risk um, in one way or another is a very widespread thing. And if you're saying nothing about it in your operating financial review, even if it's not to say we've assessed it and we don't think there's any material impact at present, there's probably a bit of a hole there. Um, so as I say, this is a very active area of ASIC focus at the area. At the moment, do go and have a look at Regulatory Guide 247 where ASIC talk about operating and financial reviews. The other areas they're focused on, impairments of non-financial assets and property assets, um, certainly increased uncertainty here. A few things to be aware of. Um, one is it's kind of been the norm in pretty much every impairment test um, I see um, that you have future inflation and 
revenue growth and cost growth at 2%. Um, now that is, doesn't hold up in the current environment. Inflation is accelerating in Australia. It's accelerating worldwide in a lot of developed economies. It's pushing up towards 10%. So it is a question of how fast are your costs going to grow? And can you actually make your prices and your revenue keep pace with that? Um, that will be a big challenge for a lot of businesses. Um, so there, are going, there is going to be a need to focus on those key assumptions around cost and, and, and revenue uh, and the disclosure around them. And the other thing I'd highlight is discount rates. Risk-free rates are climbing. Risk-free rates are climbing at the moment. Interest rates are going up and they're forecast to go up quite significantly with inflation taking off. probably means there's a need to revisit your interest rate. Sorry, audio glitch there. So there is a need to uh, revisit your discount rate for your impairment assessment and assess whether it's still appropriate. It may well need to be higher than last year. Um, Goodwill, a reminder, needs to be tested every year, and the, the appropriateness of key assumptions is going to be a big focus area. And it's not just about getting the assumptions right, it's also about the disclosure. Um, one thing ASCA picked up a lot on is instances where assumptions weren't properly disclosed and the sensitivity of those assumptions wasn't properly disclosed. Um, if you are do have an impairment issue, then do go and look at your disclosures under WS will be 136 paragraph 134 dash F. The reason I know that number is not just because I'm in a nerd, although I am, but um, also because that is the uh, paragraph in the accounting standards that I have had most ASIC queries on in the last couple of years. That's the bit where it says you have to disclose any reasonably possible change in circumstances that could result in impairments and therefore how sensitive your assumptions are. Similarly, for property assets, we need to look at, particularly for CBD assets, what the assumptions are around CBD occupancy rates and the impact that's going to have. And that's for both commercial office property and for retail property. Um, footfall is still quite low here in Perth. Um, CBD usage and footfall is around 50 to 70 percent of pre-pandemic levels, levels. Still, it's starting to pick up more in the eastern states, but still not 100 um, percent. So that's going to have various flow on effects that do need to be assessed and considered for property values, right of use asset values. If you've rented lease property and you're not using it all, is your right of use asset impaired? Um, and also for things like retailer um, revenue forecasts. Okay, a um, few notes on other things. Um, changes from previous periods, have they been considered um, and disclosed? Classification of la assets and liabilities between current and non-current. That is a big focus area. And uh, I see we had a question on it, um, particularly whether there is refinancing. Is the current and non-current split based on balance sheet date or can you decide up to the sign date of signing of the accounts? The answer there, balance sheet date, balance sheet date. So if you have debt that is due and payable on, 30th of June is due and payable within the next year. And then on 2nd of July, you either get a waiver or you sign a refinancing agreement with your bank. That doesn't matter. It still has to be disclosed as current. Now, sure, you can then disclose the refinancing as a, a non-adjusting event. So you can write about it in the notes to the accounts. But the actual classification will have to be that your debt is current. It's the position as at the balance sheet date. Similarly, if you breached your loan covenants as at the, your balance sheet date, then that debt is current unless you have a waiver from your bank before the balance sheet date. If you get a waiver from your bank on 2nd of July, that's no good. So if you, again, if you think you might be in breach of your loan covenants on balance sheet date, make sure you get a waiver from your bank before then. And it does have to be a waiver to say that they won't call the debt. Um, if it's a, just sort of a vague statement of intent to say we've got no, we have got no intention to take any action at this time, which is what banks like to give, um, that's really fairly sort of valueless. 
because that's their intention now. It could change tomorrow. If you want to classify it as non-current, it does have to be a waiver where they confirm that they, they have no contractual right to call up that debt within the next 12 months. That's what makes the debt classified as non-current. Okay, um, software as a service that I've already talked about. The, the other one I'll highlight here is aged care bed licenses. If you're in the aged care industry, there is a legislation that's in an advanced stage now, it may even have passed, to get rid of aged care bed licenses. And what that means is if you have aged care bed licenses on your balance sheet, you either need to be just writing them off or amortizing them over a very short period up to when the legislation comes into effect. Um, so if you are in the aged care industry, um, do look at that carefully and you can come and talk to us and we'll talk to you about it more, but um, your, your bed licenses are going to disappear from your balance sheet pretty quickly. Okay, we're nearly finished, but um, a couple of other things I wanted to mention very briefly. One is not-for-profit, um, what's happening in there, because um, I talked about the, the abolition of special purpose financial aid for for-profit entities. What's happening in the not-for-profit entity? Well, as I said earlier, if you're doing RD at the moment, you need to transition to our SDS. Um, but at the moment, if you're doing special purpose, you can carry on doing it because the WASB is looking at, it has a project that hasn't yet finished to look at the not-for-profit conceptual framework. And what it's probably going to do is introduce some sort of tier three reporting requirements for smaller and medium charities that will have probably different recognition and measurement requirements. They won't have to lie for us. Um, so watch this space, but for the moment, you can keep doing what you're doing um, if you're in special purpose accounts, but remember the additional disclosures I highlighted. The thing that has changed for not-for-profits is concessionary leases or peppercorn leases. Um, the WSB did temporarily exempt them from the lease standard and say you can just recognize them at cost, which means basically you can ignore them. You don't have to fair value your right of use asset. They have now made that a permanent exemption. So if you have peppercorn leases, you can just recognize the liability and asset based on the actual amount you have to pay. You don't have to determine a notional fair value, uh, which is good news and, and, and a sensible concession from the WSB. Um, quick note on ACNC, um, not for profits and charities commission, the thresholds have changed. It used to be above 250 income, you could do a, had to lodge accounts and do have them reviewed. Above a million, you had to lodge accounts and have them audited. It's now 503 million. So change to the threshold there, that'll take some of the smaller charities out of the requirement to lodge accounts. Remember, if you are below 500 though, you still have to lodge your annual information statement with the NCNC. Um, some bad news for large charities though, for large charities with two or more KMP, you will have to report aggregated remuneration from 1 July, 2022, not this year, that's next year. And then from 1 July, 2023, charities will have to report related party transactions as part of their transparency and governance. So if you do have related party transactions, think about whether you want to have them in the future because you will have to report them um, from 2023 onwards. Um, okay, um, last thing for, for anyone submitting special purpose, you will have to comply with those five standards that actually brings special purpose charities in the line with special purpose, what used to be special purpose corporations act accounts. Last thing I wanted to mention, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, is there are two new um, exposure drafts for climate related risks and reporting. Um, the IF the uh, Accounting Standards Board has now established a, a sort of sister board called the Sustainability Standards Board. They've issued exposure drafts on new sustainability standards. Um, and there will almost certainly be Australian equivalents. Um, or, so in future, anyone preparing tier one IFRS accounts, at some point in future, this isn't, this isn't law yet, but it will be. There will be material information they need to disclose about sustainability risks and opportunities uh, and the effect of climate related risks on the enterprise value. So as I say, it's exposure draft at the moment, so it may change, I'm not going to go through the detail, but it's coming, that's coming for the listed sector and publicly accountable sector in Australia. There will be much more mandatory disclosure in that area. Okay. That's everything I had in my slides. I'm very happy to take questions. Um, also for anyone who has queries based on 
specific facts um, you need advice on, do get in touch with me and my, me and my team deal with this stuff all day, every day. So we uh, can almost certainly uh, talk you through your issue and uh, work out how to solve it. Um, so do feel free to get in touch with me, but um, unless there's any more questions and answers, which I don't see anyone coming through the Q&A. Um, thank you very much for attending everyone. Um, hope you've enjoyed it. If you do have uh, friends or colleagues you think would benefit from hearing all of this, um, we are doing it again on Wednesday next week. So uh, do encourage them to sign up. Um, we are also going to re record this webinar and stick it on YouTube at some stage and send the slides around. So uh, as I say, very happy to share all of that with you. Um, but thank you for attending and uh, Goodbye.